record. This is the Weaving the World Operations Call, Wednesday, December 22nd, 2021. Fab. And uh, my wife and I are entering a, a rapid zone of multiple tasks that need to get done because we've just closed on a place and we're moving two floors. But that means actually moving all our stuff. And also this place, this new place comes with a storage unit in the building, which this was, which our current place doesn't have. So today, no, tomorrow, we're closing down those storage units and moving everything in and then blah, 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 blah. It's going to be interesting and fun. Fun? Okay. <laughs> well, Good way to look at it. <laughs> my, my cousin is moving from Rutgers, New Jersey to um, Alexandria, Virginia with her mom. And they had to like get rid. They had to do major household sort of turn down, slim down, and then they're doing the move and just like a lot of stuff. So with geography over Christmas uh, in a pandemic. So so this feels a lot lighter than than that. It is lighter, but do you have do you have help? Because I have to tell you, my car is still only one third unpacked, and what? that was just an SUV filled with stuff from the place I cleared out. It's hard. It's yeah. really, really hard. <laughs> oh, we, we, we don't have a lot of help hired up yet. We may, you know, we can easily get a tasker of some sort. We've done that before and it's very simple. You just go boop, boop, boop on the app and somebody shows up with like gloves and, and knee pads and the capacity to lift. So, yeah, I would get somebody just to help you carry the stuff. Cause even though you're only going two floors or whatever, yeah. it's, it's a lot. Well, I did buy like a, a reasonable dolly that converts into a cart and stuff like that. And there's a couple of building devices. So we will see how that goes, but, but we not, we're not moving any big furniture right now. Because, and if we were, I would, I would have hired right, right. Uh, because we don't know if we're renting this place out furnished or unfurnished. So we're going to photograph it and show it furnished. And then when somebody says yes, either plan A or plan B, we'll know what to do. Sounds so, good. Sorry for all the catch up, but that, that's what my next couple of weeks look like. Uh, we're hoping that this thing is on the market the 1st of January and that somebody says yes. Okay. So uh, getting back to the weaving world catch up, yeah. can, can one of you or both of you, I know that um, Bentley had presented a tile. So could we just catch up on what that might look like? So there's two different things that Bentley and I are talking about, logos and a tile. And, lo and Bentley in whatever order you would like to proceed in would be fabs. Yeah. Um... Yeah, Stacy, for the tile, um, it's very um, still kind of up in the air, I guess. So we can chat about that, preferably second. Um, and it's not, <clears throat> it's not a critical one. Um, I'm starting to think whether it actually fits in the tile. Oh, it's a nice to have. Um, anyway, so just quickly jumping to the logo, uh, I posted a couple photos based on what uh, Jerry and I had kind of discussed about a loosely woven um, sphere based on the Kirigami method. Um, and the photos are in the Weaving the World Ops channel on Mattermost, Stacey, if you have your- Saw them, I did. Okay, good. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So. I, I, you know, I'm never happy with a logo, and uh, <laughs> uh, so it takes this grain of salt. It, the um, it, it doesn't fit several things. Like it's it's not something you can easily monogram on something. I'm not sure how it would go on a 16 by 16 pixel uh, fave icon and stuff. But it it could be a V1, and maybe it kind of gives the impression of beta, anyways, which. I don't know, Jerry, I think you're okay with kind of building in public. So yeah, totally. letting people know the first couple of episodes are a bit rough and we're going to improve over time may not be a bad impression to give. I don't mind under construction look. Uh, and I'm really interested in sort of finding our way toward what we wind up using. Um, we could just drop it in the Favac of Jenner and see how bad it is. Yeah. Uh, and also if it were on a high, higher contrast background, because it's sort of, uh, it's a little bit gray on gray right now. Um, with a couple colors coming towards you, but the but the background is is, is not that different uh, from the object. So maybe if it were, that would oh so would on my like screen better. the background is on white. <laughs> um, my background is light gray paper paper ball. So what out, happened uh, is that to make it flexible, I left the background transparent, and I assumed that Mattermost was putting the white on there. Actually, actually, 
Actually, it is. I, I had no, no, no. It, it's not. I hadn't scrolled down enough, so I hadn't seen oh. the ones that you have that are open. Uh, so now I have. Sorry, I had only seen the first one with the with the partially. Yeah, that one came out a little faded. I also yeah. don't know why. Right now, my browser seems to be showing images a little bit less uh, saturation. Interesting. Um, the, the colors look a little muted, so I mm -hmm. bumped them up for that last one, and you can see the last one also has kind of thicker, um, wider strips of paper yeah anyways i don't know stacy if that it'd be interesting to hear your yeah opinion of those logos um i didn't really look carefully okay um i just i just looked as i was coming to the call because that's how and, i get here yeah i'm looking at no, it now we have no we haven't chosen a font and kind of how of course the wording will move around based upon the shape that's needed for the logo mm -hmm. but um I don't know, Jerry, you've probably been busy with moving, but if you had thought of any fonts or even a placeholder font. Um, I didn't do the font quest yet, so, um, but I, it wouldn't be too hard to find a placeholder font, so I'll do that. Um, and the other thing I'd like to ask Bentley um, is anything, any thoughts you had as far as the composting part of this? Well, so the call we had a little while ago was interesting, and I've been thinking since. Um, so I was thinking of composting more of um, people linking things, and I think was it Wendy that was on the call? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, it was uh, Jean Bellinger and Wendy. Wendy was saying that she wanted to do wisdom synthesis, which those are those two concepts are interrelated, but but they are different um and so i've been thinking about what the implications of that are and then jerry you were talking about with uh mark and fawn and uh the ogm thing about the two uh, things of expanding and contracting and and i think he was talking about the, you know toggling between those two and so i kind of actually feel like the the synthesis to me of wisdom feels kind of like an expansion of the content and the, the linking together sounds like a you know kind of a solidification or, or linking so i was wondering whether those need to be two phases of the same call or two separate calls or something um or maybe i'm overthinking it um i and like we also said the you know the the composting part whichever part we think of this should be able to also happen asynchronously and separately so maybe the the call is just simply giving the people the ability to collaborate on both those things and maybe on whatever order they come up so i'm okay with that i don't know um we're not going to be perfect at this so i i guess we need to kind of just decide what the first iteration is going to be mm -hmm of the process. Um, so a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one of the nice parts about our conversation on Friday was that we talked about a lot of polarities to manage. It was like, th these aren't exclusive decisions. We have to pick one path, but rather, <clears throat> hey, on this call, we're going to, or, or, or on this part of this call, we're going to start by doing this, and then we're going to start by doing that. You know, those are, those are kind of uh, structural levers we can use just to to fashion the calls and, and change how this works. So, so that felt good. And, and, and I think that, and I really like the dimensions that we brought in and the dimensions you're bringing up now. Um, it's funny, I think of synthesis as sort of reduction, not expansion. So I was thinking you were gonna say synthesis was in the, in the narrow, uh, not broaden phase. And that, and that brainstorming, brainstorming would be like in the, in the broadening phase. And then synthesis would be like, okay, so how do we express this more crisply? Uh, what does this connect to that 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 forms a, a a more crystalline view of some issue or something like that? And yeah, I, I, <clears throat> that's true in general. Um, I think in this case, though, a, a synthesis would generate additional content. Well, I think it would be a summary of it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, just linking. There would be more material, uh, but it might replace some. It might it might reword, reframe, connect up some stuff that wasn't done poorly or that wasn't done well and and it might make might might take a, a section that's kind of amorphous and fuzzy and make it make more sense and come into view and be simpler that's kind of part of my hope yeah. um and i don't know that we're all going to be able to do that or all be doing that at the same time or that so it, it, my hope is that there's a lot of that happening i'm not 
sure that our process <clears throat> is to say, okay, now everybody let's wisdom synthesize or whatever. But, but I think the outcome makes a lot of sense. That, that, so there's, there's like longer conversations to be held about what do we mean wisdom and what do we mean synthesis so that we're all sort of more or less on the same page. Um, but I was also thinking uh, like this morning in the shower uh, about mapping parties. And, and I know that I'm jumping all over metaphors, but, but um, open street maps uh, got big by throwing mapping parties. And that was in the day before everybody had a smartphone <clears throat> and GPS was ubiquitous. So a few people had Garmin and other GPS devices and so forth. And they would say, okay, great. Meet at this place at this time, bring your devices. We're going to do an hour or two of prep for those of you who are newbies and don't know how we're gonna street map this place. And then we're all going to go drive around and, and, and drive different prescribed routes uh, that we've each chosen. Then we're going to come back and show everybody how to upload the data from our devices uh, into OpenStreetMaps. And they just like lather, rinse, repeat on that process. And, and where Google to do street map basically hired people to drive the entire freaking world, which is like an insane thing that they would try to undertake and, and that they pulled off most more or less. Um, uh, OpenStreetMap crowdsourced it through these mapping parties. Okay, and not that many people know the mapping party story, but mapping party is simple and makes a lot of sense. And a lot of what we're doing is mapping. Composting is one way of looking at it, mapping is another one, right? And so maybe this is an idea mapping party or a concept mapping party or something like that. And that we, like, I, I was just thinking, how do I, I can invite people to a composting session, but it really sounds like they're gonna have a rake in hand and they're gonna be turning over smelly matter and, and it's like, mm, not so sure everybody's gonna like it, although it's intended to be a little tongue in cheek and you know, intentionally metaphoric. But if, I'm, if we're inviting people to, to, to you know, virtual mapping parties or idea mapping parties, then I'm, every, people can be like, oh, I'm an idea mapper and they'll identify. Most people won't identify that I'm a composter of conversations. Like that, that, I think that, that doesn't go very far. And I've, and I've been struggling a bit with the compost metaphor because because it functions nicely as what we're trying to do with, with information and facts and opinions and all that, but it doesn't function well as, as a, a, something that lights up people's bulbs about, oh, I'm one of those and I'd like to join this thing, <clears throat> which we need, right? So anyway, so I was playing with, with mapping, mapping party uh, today. And party is really nice because you can make it festive. It should, the, our activities ought to be fun and not like, like not neither, drudge work because oh god there's there's like this issue we have to you know fight our way through or whatever um they shouldn't be tedious they shouldn't be that serious uh but we're trying to create serious output right but there's no reason you can't have a good time doing that um so so uh, so that was a whole whole slice of it and but then i was also struck on the one hand, there's a whole bunch of separate communities like the cult of Rome and people using Rome research. And Gene was saying that he's doing multi-person Rome. You can, Rome, once one person is paying for an account, let's you invite as many other editors to your Rome blocks as you want, I think. I'm not sure. I think uh, it's as long as they have a Rome account as well. They have to register honestly with Rome. the way Zoom should do it. I'm really yeah, they have to register with Rome, things. but they don't need to have an account. That, oh. is, that is the way Zoom does, does it. They don't, they don't well, need no, to have an account. I'm sorry, it was something. That, oh, it was Airtable that yeah. I have to, for each collaborator, we have to pay a separate fee for. That's what I was thinking of Airtable. Yeah, yeah Airtable is, is a different model entirely. Um, <clears throat> so, so what's puzzling to me is that there's a whole bunch of communities that are, and, and, and part of the problem is what I'm about to describe is like one of the other communities is trying to reenact settle custom and settle custom are slips of slip boxes, basically um, slips of paper in, in index, index cards in boxes. And there's a guy named Nicholas Luhmann who long ago had a system. Uh, and when he died, there were some thousand boxes in his files with like 40,000 slips of paper each of which had notes on it. And he figured out an encoding scheme where he would write a code across the top of the card that had a bunch of little shorthands in it that connected this card through the wisdom of whatever he was picking up. It's, it's kind of arcane and, and very it's very paper card centered, but people are trying to replicate that online. And I think one of the problems with it is it's very paper card centered. And um, it, has, it has a really specific way of doing stuff. And if you're, if you're only trying to reenact that, 
you don't care about other models for knowledge. You're busy doing that. Right. And I'm trying to figure out who are the communities who are like, you know, we picked up this thing. It's kind of exciting. We're looking for better ways to, 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 to figure this thing out together. That's, that's the groups we're, we're I, I, like really interested in finding and then bringing to the party, right? So that they can keep doing what they're doing and elaborate what they're doing, but now they're doing it with others who have other tools and we can become a meeting place for these different groups with different tools. That's really interesting. And that gets us moving in a, in a super cool direction, which is another, I think, good, re good reason to just talk generally about something like mapping parties. Because like, I think all those people can see each other as mappers, of something of wisdom or something like that, uh, idea mappers, concept mappers, wisdom mappers, uh, and then coming together for a party sounds great. So I have um, a thought about that. So all these parties are happening and stuff, and um, or all these meetings. Uh, I think it, so. It makes me think about stepping back and what are the uh, what are the artifacts that we expect out of this and. So I want to get your idea, Jerry, is weaving the world, is it, is the main video content, the, the, inter, the edited interview without any mapping other than what you might do in the brain during the call? Um, or is, it, is there also that concept where we talked about some sort of, I can't remember the term, I was saying consolidation, but uh, I think someone had a better term than that. Is that because I think what would be nice is if, if we had a, a rhythm so that the, the video call would come out and then after a specific period of time, we would take, we would gather together whatever we have and produce the kind of consolidated content that says, hey, here's all the mapping we did off of it. Um, even if mapping happens on that episode later on and can build on it. But I think having a time that you announce, hey, it's now's a good time to come and look at this at the at the results of this so i think these mapping meetings and stuff like that would be determined if we had an idea of what that destination was for that artifact yeah um so a couple a couple questions a couple things just notes to myself to answer your question um i haven't published a book yet but my in my draft in one of the first paragraphs it says thank you for buying this souvenir because to me, a book is just a snapshot at a moment in time of something that should be much more interesting and richer somewhere else, right? <clears throat> and the cool thing is that a book is a snapshot and you can, you can mark it up, you can autograph it, you can, you know, it's an artifact you can sort of play with. But, but that book should lead you into the communities that are talking about the issues the book is talking about, uh, rich webs of resources. So forget bibliography at the back and as a bunch of little numbered notes. Uh, imagine, you know, deeply linked text that actually goes into context and goes into a thing, something, right? That, that something is, is not determined. But, but for me, the, the, uh, the webinar, uh, sorry, the podcast episodes, the fruiting bodies of Weaving the World are like the book, like a souvenir. They're a recognizable artifact that lives in the landscape. And you're like, oh, looks like a podcast. I think I'll come listen to a podcast. But I'm hoping that these are gateway drugs <clears throat> for playing together mapping, composting, whatever it is we wind up figuring out this thing is, right? And that the act of working together to dissolve, remix, curate, express um, what we see and hear and believe becomes a, a more routine thing that more and more people feel like they want to do and they, and, and they, and they want to contribute, which raises a bunch of thorny questions, like contribute uh, to where? Like, where is this generative commons that we've been talking about? Uh, how, do, how do I contribute to it? What sort of artifact can I contribute to it? Um, you know, how does that build up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then contribute when, because we're talking here about episodes and parties, but really um, a whole lot of this mapping can happen asynchronously on people's own time as they see, as they're taking notes and watching a video, like I'm busy. When I watch a, a really compelling, you know, YouTube talk, uh, I'm busy taking notes and doing some Googling and looking it up and adding to my brain, which is my little piece of this generative commons, which is posted openly, but not easily accessible for a bunch of reasons we've talked about a whole lot. Um, so I'll answer a couple of questions a little bit and then stop. Um, so a simple thing we can do is that each of us links to each, as many of each other's work as we see and find and like. So it's very easy for me to add permalinks to my brain that say, hey, here's, here's Bentley using this other tool. 
to do this other sort of thing. And it's really awesome. And I've categorized it and put it in my little web of how I see the world in a way that works. Uh, and then moving forward, as there might be an open global mindish brain like environment, then all of what I've done just sort of smoothly weaves into or becomes a, a, a substrate for a shared uh, mind, a shared memory of some sort that is one of many <clears throat> different representations of this collective hive mind. And what we're, what, we're, what we're kind of trying to move toward is a hive mind of some sort for civilization, right? But we're, and, and, we, and right now, the bit parts will live in open source directories, like on GitHub, like on publicly available Dropbox and Google Drive and whatever drives, like on IPFS, the interplanetary file system that lets you distribute the files. It basically chops up files, sh shards them across a variety of uh, people who are volunteering to store the, the files and then lets you find them uh, with queries and stuff like that. So, so all of those are ways we store info. Um, if we can manage to store info uh, in sort of a distributed way and it works, that's cool. And I'll add one thing, which is uh, in my brain, when I click on a thought, the brain software looks in the brain's own little proprietary database and says, ooh, what are the next links I have to show? And then boop, it brings those up. On a web browser, when I click on a link, that my web browser sends out a message to the, to the, to a, my, that the server I just clicked on sends a message across the world that says, hey, everybody, Jerry's browser needs these bits. Send them over to Jerry's browser. And, and those bits can be little, and some of them are ad servers and freaking you know, surveillance technologies, but they can live any place on the inner tubes and they just show up in my browser. My browser like, catches them, presents them nicely. Wherever it can't get one, it shows me a broken image, which doesn't happen very much anymore because this is the system works so well. Um, and, and we're done. We're like happy. And why can't a shared memory be more like a web browser and HTML components being picked up from everywhere, which then says, oh, OK, so that middle thing that the, the, the framework, the, 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 the fungus, whatever it is, is in fact a lot like the web is constructed, which is little people, little uh, small parts loosely joined, right? Which is the title of David Weinberger's, one of David Weinberger's many fine books, small pieces loosely joined. <clears throat> um, and I'm like, yes, that sounds really good to me. Um, and, and then I don't know how that fits in the, in the internet archive, which is storing web pages, which means it's already doing a good, a very good job of storing a highly distributed shared memory. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. That, that's already working. What we might, what might be wanting to do is, is create new layers of, of, of how this works on top of it. So sorry, that was a lot of stuff, but, but um, you, you provoked a lot of good stuff. So do we want uh, to have a souvenir after the podcast? Um, so I think we have... Uh, so I think a single consolidation souvenir, you yeah, yeah. snap at a shot in time, right? So, so there's a web page for every episode of Weaving the World. And I'm, I've already created, you know, four web pages for the first four episodes, which are not finished produced. Um, and uh, somewhere on those pages, there would be links to as many other projects that feed that episode as we can find. So that, that, that's one artifact. One of those links will go to my brain at the thought for that episode. And then that links directly to whatever the heck I've woven for that episode. And the existence of that page or node starts before the call, when we've planned and decided that there's going to be a call or an episode with this person about this topic. So that actually instantiates that the beginning of that memory, that little node, which is already connected to a context. So, so it's kind of like nothing starts from scratch. Uh, almost nothing starts from scratch. Everything begins as a as a as an irritant somewhere in the in the nexus of stuff already, uh, and then as anybody else decides to contribute, and as we figure out how to converge our contributions through hashtags in public, through uh, some kind of alert mechanism that says, "Hey, I added something to the to the fungus, and it's over here. Here's my link." Right? As we figure out a protocol for doing that then even by the time of the call, we can have a pretty rich um, context going. Call happens, uh, party or composting call happens later and just makes it better. And then every six months, every six calls, 
um, we have a, like a like a where are we? Let's weave across the calls session, where we then where we then go up a little layer and say, oh, we talked about this, and here are the common threads through these things. And 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 after the fifth call, I had this epiphany where how about this? And we're all like, oh wow, yes. And that lets us go back and like rework, refactor, uh, fix some of what we did, make it better, and then move. And that might even change our agenda for whom to talk to next, where to go next, all of that. And that sounds exciting to me. That sounds like a fun journey into wisdom synthesis, right? And, and, and I wonder, I'm, I'm maybe, maybe I'll ask Wendy, um, Wendy McLean to, ask, to listen to this part of it. I'm wondering how much of this would resonate for Wendy and how much of this she'd be like, no, 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 what, what we really need to do is this other thing. Um, but that, that works for me. How about you guys? Yeah, I was thinking that, it, the um the way to submit yeah so i think one central place like it yes it's good that if we link to each other's stuff although that'll be difficult as content's coming in how you know new content's being done so the the central place is is on the episode um that people can look um uh, so, yeah, we do need some way for someone to submit a link to some mapping or some synthesis that they. So did. right now, that could be the metamorphosis channel for the calls, right? So, so one of the things that works well for me is I listen yeah. in on conversations on mailing lists, on mattermost, on whatever else. Like we have a bunch of metamorphosis channels. When a cool new thing shows up, I go curate it into my brain. Uh, yes. Do we want to then invite anyone on the internet who watched? the show to go to into Mattermost. So is that kind of a high lift for someone who just watched the video, created their own map? Do we need so an easier submission process? Doesn't need to be Mattermost. I'm pointing there only because we've uh, we've stood it up to be this artifact, to be like a place to converse about uh, this set of conversations over time. It could be a Discord server. It could be a Google group. Although at this point, it's like, but you know, I'm anything. just not sure conversation is even is the goal of this need. It's I saw the video, I built something, and then I want the link on the on the episode so that other people can find it. Yes, uh, and so here we need somebody who is the editor or guardian of the episode page that we think we control that that will block the attempts to say, "Hey, Joe's Pizza," like like would like to be woven into the into your web, and we're like, mm, you know, Joe's Pizza. That's not what we're doing here. Yeah, we also um, need a process for them to submit that. Which is which is kind of what Wikipedia does, but but Wikipedia doesn't have a submission process. Wikipedia lets anybody go edit any page and then stops them by saying, "Oops, what you did wasn't what we do," <clears throat> right? And so you, then they, then some editor who has purview over some domain reverts the change, hopefully still sends a nice note that says, "Hey, notice you just changed the page for carbon." Uh, the way we've been, we've decided as a group to do this is this other way. Uh, you're welcome to play with us and we'd love to be helpful, right? It's a community invitation to be part of the mapping. And I, I think that that's a really high functioning, <clears throat> even to this day, in, in the face of people who are intentionally trying to, to spin pages and, and delete themselves or whatever, you know, that still pretty, pretty much works. So, so I think a lot of that we can kind of emulate or borrow. Well, yeah, I guess I'm just thinking through what is the submission process. Yeah. Practically, like if they have to join Mattermost. I, I, we, at some point early on, I think we require a registration on something so that we know that some person is a real person. And we start with that because going, in, going full anonymous right up front is just like opening the gates of hell. And it's possible that uh, Peter... Peter already has in mind a process because it's a it's on a wiki, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? So it theoretically anyone should be able to go in and and yes and no the right? the, pa the page that I've created for each of the episodes is actually over on Google Sites. It's not living right. in the, in the, but in is the it, OGM is wiki. It, is it generated at all? Uh, we so uh, I was or looking for I was looking for Pete to to sort of generate and do that kind of okay. stuff so that we can embed it 
in the pages and the pages will just be frames but pete was like let's just do everything manually for now okay let's so just walk, let's just get a get a, a few episodes stood up full manual so that we know what we actually want to do and then what we want to uh, automate because if we if we automate prematurely we will wind up sort of paving the wrong cow paths or something like that yeah i think what would be would would be nice in the future is a way for people to submit links a way for someone to review those links which of course is is a bottleneck and yeah. then um a way for me to also subscribe to that episode or all the episodes so i know when a new piece of content is added that i may want to weave into my content mm -hmm. uh, those are that's those are progressively um less important right and future far far farther future but yeah just, just, uh, and the good news is that there's a bunch of technologies now for subscribing to stuff. And there's also a bunch of technologies for tagging stuff, which is different. Yeah. And we might want, we might, and we might find ourselves exploring new, new areas like, Hey, I want to subscribe to the stream of stuff that's coming out of this, this project, except I only want things relevant to these four keywords. Right. Yeah. And that, that would might, definitely be nice. Yeah. And, and so if, so another, Another habit that is not common on Wikipedia, but is super common on, on the socials is, is hashtags. And, ha and, and I'm usually shocked and mostly pleased at how well people are using hashtags. Like, like mm -hmm. they might over hashtag, they might took, put way too many on, on a post. However, they're usually doing a lot of useful hashtagging that lets a post get found. And so one way of submitting something to Weaving the World is hey use whatever use one of these ten media that we're tracking, put this hashtag on it, which we will try to make unique, but may not be. And anybody could could bomb just by using the hashtag too much. But for a while until it stops working, use this hashtag, and that we consider a submission. <clears throat> and 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 it will go into the queue for some process to figure out where it fits, right? And then we could do a little bit of simple matching like oops we already have this link so thank you very much and there's a bunch of stuff we could kind of sort of do there but then we have a collection problem but but hopefully people aren't just sending in hey this is an interesting story on the topic they're sending in hey i built a piece of a map and i'd like to play with you all that, that's the more interesting submission right it's like i'm a mapper too here's here's the tool i like to use or build <clears throat> how do how do how do we play together that that's that's the that's the person and the, the thing we want to find a lot of. And this rapidly spirals out of hand if it gets popular, like, like rapidly, because any one, any three, any three contributors who are like excited about it and just showed up and have a lot to say are going to flood the zone with what they're doing, which means if we're thinking ahead a little bit, we have to figure out processes that, that handle floods well, <clears throat> that don't make everybody go, oh God, I'm overwhelmed, I'm out of here. Because I can see that happening. Yeah. Well. So if as long as there's some sort of gatekeeper, then um, it doesn't overwhelm. You just have a bottleneck. Yeah. And which would reduce future submissions, but at least it gives you time to fix the issue before it affects everyone else. Right. And and by the way, there are hopefully multiple fungi we're not we're not the only game in town we're just trying to pioneer this process and hopefully the 700 club and steve bannon want to create fungi to basically model what they believe and and why and how and down the road a couple of years a really interesting thing is when there's like a fungus battle or a fung off or whatever we call it when these different structures meet and try to compare notes in good faith right like what does that look like how does that work um, so these are submissions to the thing we think we're doing, but we're not trying to become the Wikipedia, which is an attempt to have a canonical version of the Wikipedia. We're trying to be uh, a clonable, spawnable, uh, shared collective memory that can host pretty different points of view. Yes, please. <laughs> so, so now you kind of hit on where my head's been spinning this whole time. Um, so when, but I don't want to go on a tangent, but when you, so when you're talking about parties, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, getting three diverse people together, maybe even with a data butler, 
you know, I don't know if it was, I think it was John that had mentioned on a call about how like the internet was made up of like the wrestling group, the academics and something else. And when that was said, I was thinking, yes, but within each of those groups, they were all reasonable people. And I know because I've met them. And so one part of me was thinking, what about if a team was getting one from each of those groups together with a data butler? And then at the end, all the data butlers come together and do the work because then it's, it's you're tapping into people that aren't necessarily tech minded or even thinking in that direction, but they have wisdom. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is even among ourselves, if we came up with, let's say 10 different, I don't know what you'd call it, um, categories or traits or 10 different things that needed to be represented within each team, even among ourselves, like we needed, we needed, you know, an older white man, <laughs> we needed, you know, whatever categories we want to decide. And one person could encompass more than one of those traits, but we made sure that every one of those traits were checked off the box. And that created a complete team. And, you know, teams could be interchangeable, mm -hmm. you know, you mm -hmm. could, but those are the categories that need to be represented. So I'm sort of in the very beginning before, you know, I'm not as, as um, focused on what happens after. I'm more interested in getting at least three different strong directions that we could grow in. So I don't want to have a fungi war later on. I want to, I want to weave way before right in the beginning part. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I like that a ton. Uh, I have a bunch of different thoughts about it. One of them is, um, how do you get a pod of white supremacists to create any contribution to that? Okay, so I would not be looking for white supremacists, but if I'm just talking about like people I know, yeah, I know people that may not consider themselves to be a white supremacist, but I know they have that in the, they have that bias there. Yeah, but they also know that it's wrong or they wouldn't be trying to hide that bias yeah. and they also have other things that they are accurate and knowledgeable on and however their views were formed it came from somewhere and by being in a room with two other people i mean that's what daryl did yeah so yeah yeah i wouldn't go after a white supremacist but all white supremacists are not the same <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even, exactly. um and 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 having a <clears throat> having some sort of barrier or requirement for a team, in, in it sort of creates a series of things. Meaning you've got to govern that. You've got to check that it's true. You've got to as soon as they've lost that diversity, do they fall out and do we kick them out? I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting issues that show up if we start to create structures like that. But I really like building diversity in at the beginning, not at the end. Like it's like really important that we do that. So well, how what about we... if we design from trust and we assume that they're telling the truth? Well, <laughs> that... <laughs> so systems that are designed from trust are actually carefully designed. And what you do is you then you then layer in some things, but you're trying to get the community to do its own governance, to, to you know, to sort of um, you're trying to get the dynamics of the situation such that you don't need to have an enforcement branch that then says you didn't meet, you didn't do whatever. Right. That the. That, 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 community and the structure self-reinforce. And I think I think you've opened a really nice design question about what what sorts of things do we do we create or institute so that those dynamics show up. So the the other idea that, you know, so if we're talking about people we know and putting this together, that's one thing and I think we can trust that they'll have, you know, that they'll do what they're supposed to do, make sure the right boxes are checked off. If this were to grow though, Maybe maybe we put the teams together. Maybe they check off their things and they're randomly put in a group of three. So one mechanism that could easily be instituted is like a, a clerotherian and a, a, what's it called? Assortation. It's basically you get randomly assigned into a group and you, you need to figure out how to work with this group to make something happen. That is completely a, a device we could implement. And we could say, hey, we find we find that this process actually weirdly really, really works. Please, please go through this tunnel and you'll wind up in a group. And, and what, whatever you can create with that group is what will be what will be weighted more heavily as a contribution into the effort, for example. Right. If we if we know if we know what went through this process, then we're like, 
happier with it than a rogue submission from an individual. Well, I love that for a few reasons. One, because we're creating new people that might connect with each other. But I would also want the ability to leap, like not to have to stay in that group. Yeah. You know, I, I'd also want to be able to like, you know, move to another group. And maybe we do move one, you know, have some sort of, yeah, I know what you were just thinking when I did. I think I know what you were thinking. No, 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 when I, I, was, I think I was having a different thought. Um, we have a lot of black belts like Nancy White and others who are really good at group dynamics and setting up things like this thoughtfully. I, I'm an amateur. And I'm just spouting ideas off the top of my head, but I think that what you're pointing to is super important. And I think we should sort of bump this up to, to people who've got deep experience in, in setting up group process and could recommend a few experiments. Uh, there are very likely groups already doing this kind of process in the world that we could go like, you know, can we have what you're having and how do we instantiate it? That'd be great, uh, et cetera. I think, I think like looking up and looking around would inform us pretty quickly on some really pretty, um, hopefully um, robust and exciting uh, ways to do this. And I uh, think those conversations, you know, calling in those people and having those conversations are worthy of, you know. Those are actually, epi ep those are episodes yes. of Leaving the World. Exactly, exactly. Um, I love that. Bentley, you've been, you've been very patient wanting to jump in a couple of times. Go ahead. Oh, um, I, I think I was distracted by something else, but I do, I do think that, that um, uh, I think that's all, Stacey, I think that's all very important and very useful and interesting. I don't know whether you're proposing that as a replacement for a kind of an open mapping call or just an addition to. I'm not sure, to be honest, because I that's why I gave it in a few different ways. Okay. Because I I would I guess the my the concern when hearing that is that that um I Yeah, I guess there's several ways to say. I wouldn't, I'm not sure that I would want to participate in any kind of group mapping. <laughs> like I'm already doing that with several other groups and it's um, it's challenging even it's hard. when you're all very like-minded. Um, but would you want to be on the call with the data butlers? Like after, after the data butlers have been with all the different teams and then they all got together to put it together, is that something that you would want to be a part of? As data butlers, did you say that a minute ago, or is that a new that term was, in this call? That, no, that was that was part that was new in this call, but it, but okay. part of what, I just part of what sure Stacey I mentioned earlier. That's it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, what would that call be? So, yeah. Stacey was saying that one of the roles that a team would have, or that we or that we would assign to a team, or something like that, would be a data butler, whose whose responsibility is to sort of capture what they wove or did and bring it back into the hive in some metaphoric sense. And then the data butlers would meet. And, and, and Stacy, uh, I, I like the idea of sprinkling ex expertise in the groups in some way. Uh, one of the problems with trying to represent an outside group and then bring that back and weave it in is that mostly, mostly things get lost in translation. Um, it's really hard to represent what they thought if you're not actually them. So, so maybe, maybe, the, maybe, maybe the mechanism is if you have a team, and I agree with Bentley that this thing is hard to do in teams, so we need to figure out what that means and how that works. Um, but maybe one of the ways to submit uh, something is to, is to assign one of your team as the data butler uh, or the data ambassador or the, or the vision ambassador or whatever. <clears throat> and that person comes in and represents and is in full conversation with the rest of the team, but they participate in some other sub process that's like, oh, here's how we synthesize and here's how we, how we, where we put things and how we do things. So maybe that's a slightly different twist on the, on the data butler, but, but there's a, Dave Snowden is brilliant in uh, any layers you put in between raw data and decision makers, screw things up. Like usually an attempt to synthesize and, and improve in the middle often breaks uh, what the real data said. Uh, and I realize that as we're sitting here talking a lot about wisdom synthesis and all that, maybe we're breaking that that precept. And I'd love to know what people like Dave Snowden think about the process in, as a whole. Uh, but there's this. But there's this. How do you actually represent what people hold dear and what people are trying to contribute? Uh, how do you hold that so that it's intact into the the mix? And how do you prevent a super brilliant, crisp, interesting point of view from being homogenized out of existence? 
on its way into the synthesis process. That happens a lot too. So, so one of the reasons I'm really interested in multi-hives and lots of people having, lots of groups having representations of what they believe is that a couple of these groups are going to have just really crisp, brilliant representations that are gonna stand out. <clears throat> and, and some others will look like pudding and, and primordial goo, then will be like, mm, okay, and, and won't, won't be very attractive. Um, and I'm trying to not, I'm trying to create a, a, a method or a system that will not homogenize or destroy the really beautifully articulated ones that, that, that lets, them, lets them live and, and live stronger. And, and one, one way that keeps coming back in my head on this is, is there a way to vote up or prefer or give extra bonus points to groups or, or, or submissions that do certain things? Like, hey, you're going to bump way up the queue if you had diversity and if you submitted in this format and if you did whatever. And it's like, there's a queue and everybody in the world can put something in the queue. And we've got some filters for like getting rid of spam and other kinds of stuff that you just get bumped off the, off the conveyor belt. But if you, if you meet these five criteria and, ha <clears throat> and have a data butler, then you zoom to the front of the queue and we talk to you next. Uh, that's that's really interesting because because that gives people uh, a feedback mechanism to do the right thing to to offer content into the the matrix. I really like that. Yeah, that's interesting. That's complicated, but it's nice. I mean, uh, and we're not we're nowhere near that phase. And what Bentley said a moment ago sort of really rings for me is that like I I think I told the story where five years ago I had a meeting with two other black belt brain users, none of whom are in our conversations here, but uh, we were comparing notes and like we used the brain, which we all three loved in completely different ways. And one of us, I couldn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. Like, like he was using every advanced feature in the brain. And at one point I said, okay, so I understand getting things done as a GTD as a process. And he's, he was a fan of GTD. So could you just put a new GTD item into your brain uh, and show us what that is? He then created a new brain file, which surprised me. I'm like, why would you need a new brain file? And then ran a couple macros that did poop, 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 poop. And at the end, I couldn't see a, a GTD item there. I, I was like, I don't know what you just did. And that was three humans who love the same, same tool. So, so there's this real interesting challenge for how to create collective wisdom and and what came up in the conversation yesterday with Marc Antoine um, was that pattern language communities, communities that have developed good functioning pattern languages have found that rhythm and figured out a method for doing some of this kind of stuff because a pattern language is in fact wisdom synthesis. It's a really nice example of wisdom synthesis. Um, and so I think one of the first places we should sort of go is we should knock on the doors of some of those communities like liberating structures, like pure gaji, which were already woven into, uh, you know, uh, and figure out, okay, good. So how do we elevate all of this and, and weave it together better? Uh, a fun project would be, how do we, how do we add value to the pure Gaji work, the, the artifacts, and how do we make them highly functional in a weaving the world world? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and, and, <sighs> how do we do that helping people who normally aren't at the table who are either don't have the geek chops or aren't in the same communities or whatever how do we actually encourage um serving people who normally are going to get spoken for by someone else and, and letting them like like helping them participate fully how do we make that a, a primary piece of the of the process well i think the filters that you spoke about would help that uh, yes. All of which has taken us very far from the logos that Bentley presented at the top of the call. Um, but it's good, but it's like, you know, this is, this is um, useful stuff. Yeah, so taking, taking a step back, um, I think uh, we, we don't know how all the composting and, and post-processing is gonna happen. We're working through that and that's okay. So Jerry, you're still going to edit together the podcasts mm -hmm. and post those. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what happens. And then you're gonna, I guess you're gonna choose a font and then I will uh, just throw the temporary logo uh, with some font 
maybe maybe be helpful to know what we need because right now the weaving the world website has a banner at the top so do we want something that goes up there pete had posted there's a couple of links I've, I've got that i can share also back into that same channel uh, Pete had posted a couple links about uh, if you're building a logo or, a, or an ID, here's the five or six formats you need that ID to function in. Uh, so, you know, podcast size, fav icon size, banner size, and, and one or two others. <clears throat> um, but there's a couple posts like that. Yeah, it'd almost be nice to. Here's uh, one of them. Yeah. It, this this came up in a recent ops call as well. So here's a 99 designs has a page. Oop, there we go. Uh, there's a couple people who've done sort of a summary of here, here are standard sizes, here are standard dimensions. And then some of these sites get really, really good. And it turns out that if you're trying to advertise on Amazon, it's got very specific requirements that are different from, you know, the other standard stuff that you might be trying to do, et cetera. So we just need to pick a uh, high level uh, blanket couple formats. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we, I, but we I, want I, a standard podcast size icon, for example, for a podcast, right? That's like, that's like the first, th that and a banner and a fave icon are the, clearly the first three that we, we need to do. Anything else I think is gravy. Yeah. So for the website, something that will fit where you currently have the text. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, or up in the corner or whatever, but yeah, probably like big and like big and strong in the middle of the of the top of the page. Yeah. Um, Silly idea just occurred to me um, because I'm looking at your renderings of the uh, open-ended uh, Kirigami globe and you've got shading, like you've got, you know, light source and shading and stuff like that, which is lovely. And it, uh, it would be interesting and maybe hard to do to actually sort of fake like lighting through the Kirigami globe projects out the words weaving the world so that it looks like a cast shadow um, of text. Um, yes, that would be challenging. <clears throat> well, it would, be, it would be extremely challenging to actually have a Kirigami uh, artifact that, that did the projection. That's impossible. But it would be interesting to maybe fake that or to, or to nominally suggest that through color choice and lighting and font choice. <clears throat> I think that's sort of what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I am using a full 3D model and physically based renderer. Yeah. Um, so for instance, if the font had a little bit of 3D to it and had the light source in the same direction, that's even a start. Yeah, so it looked like it was projected. So it looked like the light was actually lighting both the artifact and the font. Like that's, that's even a start, right? I may be overcomplicating as I tend to do. Yeah, we might do that for the V2. I think yeah. right now we'll just need to use yeah. the plain font. And uh, But I, I guess the question is, is that is that fall, which do you prefer, the thicker, the thinner lines, and is that acceptable for V1? Is, and then just regular font next to it. Yeah, Stacy preferences between thick and thin lines? Uh, not ribbons? I'm not helpful on this. <laughs> OK. Um, I prefer the thicker one, I think. I think so too, although it winds up looking a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. I like the, the spacier globe because it sort of feels spacier. It feels like there's more room to play or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I like the aesthetics of the wider ribbons. Well, the water one will probably show up better on the fave icon. We can try and see. Yeah. Yeah. And it's pretty, it's, I mean, as, as, a, as a test drive, it's pretty easy to drop a, an image into the fave icon generator and just see what it coughs up. Um, and if it's unintelligible, if it just looks like a drop of goo, then that's not going to work too well. But, um, but if it starts looking like anything interesting, we're, we're rocking. 
And for the public, what is a favicon generator? Oh, so uh, you know what a favicon is? No. Okay, so look in your browser. Um, see, you have tabs in your browser? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the little, like the mattermost thing would be the circle with the, okay. Thank you. And LinkedIn looks like the LinkedIn logo only shrunk to uh, like 16 by 16 pixels, actually, I think is the size. Got uh, it. Which is which, which is wee tiny, but a good but a but a good fave icon actually like really calls out and stands out like, oh, this is what this is, right? Like the Zoom one. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> and you know, Gmail has a big M envelope thing, and uh, Google Calendar has like a calendar page in the same color scheme. And, Got it. And the, the YouTube one is one of the most like best. Like YouTube's fave icon is the little play button on a red red button with a white triangle. That's just like wow. Um, and there are pieces of software you can use that will automatically you give it a graphic and it'll say this is what I think it looks like as a fave icon, and then they let you edit pixel by pixel <clears throat> so you can fine tune what the thing looks like, and then they let you export your edited creation in a format. Uh, favicon.ico, well, .ico is basically a favicon Thank you. Uh, format. And then you drop that on your website and everything that presents knows to go look there and put that up on the browser tab, for example. Okay. Um, so I'll, 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 in the middle of my chaos, I'm gonna look at fonts and see what I might recommend since that will be that will like you know font plus one of these images rendered uh put into the right formats and we've got a starting point and i am completely comfortable with starting format looking as if it's under construction and us just tweaking and improving or whatever very comfy with this looking uh half built at the start so so in that case the, the fact that it's woven and kind of open isn't that bad <laughs> <laughs> works works fine yeah because i can't it, the, unfortunately the way uh, i have things curling back it looks more like it's unraveling than being it looks like it's just exploded a bit yeah yeah right, right yeah right. which is very 2021 20, 22 right yeah very exactly 2021 20, yeah do you remember a poster years ago like i don't know how many years 40 years ago 50 years ago it was um i get high with a little help from my friends and it was gulliver and he was all tied up with all these like little people. Does that sound familiar to anybody? No, I've, I've, the Gulliver image is of course familiar, but not I get high with a little help from my friends. I, I missed that one somehow. Well, cause the, so the little friends were like tying him up. Cause every time I think of weaving the world, I see like these little strings and people like tying it up. <laughs> Let's see images, there's Gulliver. I need to go over to the search. Oh, there Sounds we go. I, yeah, I, uh, so I just found the. Uh... Did you find it? I mean, it's at least 45 years old, 50 years old. Well, just to throw you back into ancient history, uh, you can buy it as a backlit post, a blacklight poster for 15 Yeah, it's bucks. none of those. That okay. wasn't it. That's not it? Okay, good. <laughs> um, is it any of these? And actually, let me add Gulliver. Yeah, I don't want to waste your time on this. <laughs> okay. I can uh, look. No, none of these seems to. I added Gulliver and that didn't help. <clears throat> I do All remember right. some memes showing Gulliver tied up with the Lilliputian. Yeah. Um, um, shoot, I was having a different thought. What was you were thinking you were going to look for fonts. I was gonna look for fonts, but I just, uh, yeah, I just made a, a bookmark note for that. There was something else I was gonna say, and then we're at the top of our hour, but um, what else was I thinking about? Um, the episode, shoot. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, was it about the favicon? I think it was about the designs and the text and something together with that, but I've lost what it was. So, so uh, let's just talk through the the weaving the world ops channel and share more of these. Uh, I will poke in some font ideas and we'll see where that goes. Yeah, great. And I'll cool. um, produce some preliminary icons for the specifically the most important one is the um, podcast. 
cover logo, um, which is a square, I believe. Yeah. I'll go see what Apple suggests because um, they're the most common format. And then yep. um, save icon and then the banner. We'll start with those three. That sounds great. Cool. Uh, I just remembered what it was. Um, given you're using a 3D rendering program of some sort, is it possible to texture map a globe onto the ribbons? Uh, yes. Um, is that an easy experiment or a hard experiment? Um, it depends on whether you can get a... a well, a do you want things positioned correctly or is it just like as if I took a map, cut it up into strips and wove it into a ball and they don't... Which is probably far them. easier, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you could texture map onto the ribbons and then just weave them. I think a cut up globe uh, randomly like would be really pretty brilliant. Now, I'm pretty sure visually that wouldn't work for the fave icon. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you, that, that level of detail wouldn't show up at all. So let's... I, I think that that because it doesn't work at all three levels, I yeah. think let's save that as a as let's skip that for now. But, but, but put that in the back I of your like head. I like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like that. And in particular, if it's kind of garbled, I really like that. If, if, if it's not, hey, let's here's see. Africa, here's Asia, uh, but rather, oops, you know, now I the think question that's is, great. do you want an old timey map or a modern map or even better yet, both, right? A mix, a mix of both. Uh, that, that sounds great. And that's more work also. Uh, but, but also because the globe as currently rendered looks like it exploded, that actually immediately echoes for me that our world is exploding. And mm -hmm. part of the reason we're trying to weave is we're trying to reweave and fix the social fabric. We're actually like, like to me, maybe the exploded rather than the simple earnest crafts person trying to make the thing, the, 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 the wounded globe um, feels closer to our mission somehow. Interesting, yeah. Right? Because there's this piece about what we're doing is repair, um, uh, not some new creative endeavor just because. Yeah. So Great. I like that a lot. Cool. All right. I'm off to do, do some packing and a bunch of other sort of stuff, so. Thank you. Goodbye. See you on the inner tubes. Thank you.